Um, so this morning we're going to be singing a song called He Knows My Name. And it's a song that has been on the radio. It's been out there for probably about 10 years now. It's really been a meaningful song for me. I've, I've even sung it here at the church with a backup track. But this morning we're going to do it with just the piano um, because I think it deserves that simple touch. Uh, over the last few months in particular, I've been kind of on a journey um, of discovery. I've been learning what it truly looks like uh, to find my identity in God and to fully, fully recognize that I am his child and nothing more and nothing less. For a long time, I found my identity in the fact that I was blind or visually impaired. I was born that way, and it did define how I lived because it was obviously the way that I saw the world around me. And there were times I felt like, and I continue to feel like, I'm too much for other people. I'm always asking for favors. I'm always asking for help. I'm always the needy one. And I'm thinking someone's going to pick up their phone, and they're going to see my name and their caller ID, and they're going to say, oh, what does she want? I never want to be the needy person. I never want to be too much. But at the same point, I never want to feel like I'm not enough. And I felt that way as a person with a disability. I felt like I don't measure up. And I have to remind myself that, that God is, um, that, that he is my one and only. I'm enough for him, and he's going to sustain me. Losing my voice recently also caused me to ask questions of my identity. Who, I, who am I if I don't have a voice to sing? Am I enough without my voice? And so when Jerry and Bonnie contacted me and started talking about the service for today, I knew that we had to do this song. And so we're going to sing He Knows My Name, and I hope that you and I were all reminded that we are God's child. We are his. We belong to him. So this is He Knows My Name. Spent a day in a conversation in the mirror, face to face with somebody less than perfect. I wouldn't choose me first if I was looking for a champion. In fact, I'd understand if you picked everyone before me. But that's just not my story. True to who you are, you saw my heart and made something out of nothing. I don't need my name in lights. I'm famous in my father's eyes. Make no mistake, he knows my name. I'm not living for applause. I'm already so adored. It's all his stage. He knows my name. He knows my name. I'm not meant to just stay quiet. I'm meant to be a lion. I'll roar beyond a song with every moment that I've got. True to who you are, you saw my heart and made something out of nothing. I don't need my name in lights. I'm famous in my father's eyes. Make no mistake, he knows my name. I'm not living for applause. I'm already so adored. It's all his stage. He knows my name. He knows my name. He calls me chosen, free, forgiven, wanted, child of the King, his forever, held and treasured. I am loved. I don't need my name in light. I'm famous in my Father's eyes. I don't need my name in lights. I'm famous in my father's eyes. Make no mistake. 
mistake. He knows my name. I'm not living for applause. I'm already so adored. It's all his stage. He knows my name. He knows my name. Good morning and welcome to our worship service this morning. What a delight it is to be together in God's house. What a delight it is to know that God has called us together because this is the very best place each and every one of us could be right now at this point in our lives. And so look to be blessed by his presence as together we worship our God. If you're visiting with us today, we especially want to welcome you. And we hope that the time we spend together will be precious to you because your presence with us this morning is very precious with us. And of those, those of you who are watching us on some electronic media, we want to welcome you too. We hope too that God is blessing you with a, with a blessed Sabbath day. We would also invite you to come worship with us sometime if you can, if you're able to. We really look better in person than we do over the electronic media. So please, <laughs> please plan to join us sometime. I've looked over the announcements in the bulletin. You all have access to that. Just a couple of things. Jennifer Burley is with us today. I haven't seen Jennifer Burley for at least half of her lifetime, <laughs> which makes her getting older, almost catching up with me. But anyway, she has a birthday today also, so when you see her afterwards, wish her a happy birthday, Jennifer. We're glad that you've chosen to worship with us this morning. Thank you. The only other thing that sticks out in my mind, in, in my eye, as I look at the announcements, it's Donut Day, and I'm so happy that you've invited me to be with you on Donut Day because I've often looked, I've always looked at donuts as the original health food. It's the very best that you can take. You know, there's two things about food. Food should be healthy for us and food should make us happy. And donuts indeed cover both of those. <laughs> so uh, thank you again for inviting me on this special day. I'm going to ask the congregation, to please stand now, please rise. Our call to worship comes from the words of Psalm 63. It's my hope and my prayer that the words of the psalmist are in your lips and on your hearts today also and in your minds. The psalmist writes, O God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My body longs for you in a dry and weary land where there is no water. I've seen you in the sanctuary and beheld your power and your glory. Because your love is better than life, my lips will glorify you. I will praise you as long as I live. And in your name, I lift up my hands. Let's come into God's presence in a moment of prayer. Lord God Almighty, you who created us, you have made us who we are, made us in your image. We gather together this morning to praise you, praise you for your presence in our lives. Your name, Lord, is above all other names. Your love for us is immeasurable. We cannot count all the blessings that you continually lay upon us. And as we worship you today, we pray that you will fill our hearts and our minds and our souls with your abundance. Let your presence in our worship be evident. May you open our ears to hear from you and our hearts to receive you. Accept our sacrifice of worship on this very special day. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. To those who have been called, who are loved by God the Father and kept by Jesus Christ, mercy, peace, and love be yours in abundance. Amen. Take a moment to greet those people around you with a warm handshake and a friendly smile, and following this time, uh, the girls, the duo, will, uh, <laughs> will lead us in a time of praise.
What gift of grace is Jesus my Redeemer? There is no more forever now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom, my steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. To this I hold, my hope is only Jesus, for my life is wholly bound to His. Oh, how strange and divine I can sing, all is mine, yet not I, but through Christ in me. sure the price it has been paid for Jesus bled and suffered for my pardon and he was raised to overthrow the grave to this I hold my sin has been defeated Jesus now my plea. Oh, the chains are released. I can sing. I am free and not I, but through Christ in me. With every breath, I long to follow Jesus, for he has said that he will bring me home. And day by day, I know he will renew me until I stand with joy before the throne. To this I hold, my hope is only Jesus. All the glory evermore to him. When the race is complete, still my lips shall repeat, yet not I, but through Christ in me. To this I hold, my hope is only Jesus. All the glory evermore to him. When the race is complete, still my lips shall repeat, yet not I, but through Christ in me. When the race is complete, still my lips shall repeat, yet not I, but through Christ in me. Yet not I, but through Christ in me. Yet not I, but through Christ in me.
Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God. Born of his spirit, washed in his blood. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, perfect delight. Visions of rapture now burst on my sight. Angels descending bring from above. Echoes of mercy, whispers of love. This is my story. This is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, all is at rest. I in my Savior am happy and blessed. Watching and waiting, looking above. Filled with his goodness, lost in his love. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. The words of Ephesians, of Ephesians chapter 2 remind us of our state, the state we are in this world without God. Reminds us of, of, of where we really are or where we would be. Listen to what he says. Listen to how he rates us. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live. When you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient, all of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our sinful nature and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature objects of wrath. That's where we are, living in a sinful world. Without Jesus Christ, that's where we are. We are objects of wrath. And that old sin keeps bothering us, keeps bugging us, keeps tempting us. And so... I'm guessing, I'm hoping that all of you this morning would confess that you are sinners. Even though we come to church, even though we read the Bible, even though we love God, we still sin. And we have to ask for forgiveness for that sin in order to worship God purely and from the heart. Let's do that in a time of prayer. Join me. Almighty and most merciful Heavenly Father, we confess this morning, Lord, that we have erred and we have strayed from your ways. Lord, we are not like unlike lost sheep who wander away, bumping into things, struggling through each and every day. We confess we have followed too often the devices and the desires of our own hearts while we've ignored your holy laws, while we've left undone those things which we ought to have done, and Lord, while we've, while we've done those things which we ought not to have done. Indeed, we admit this morning there is nothing good in us. We ask that you will have mercy on us, O Heavenly Father. Miserable offenders that we are, have mercy. Spare those, O God, who confess their faults. Restore those who are penitent according to your promises declared upon men and women in Christ Jesus our Lord. 
Grant that we may hereafter live godly, righteous lives, sober lives, that we may live to the glory of your holy name. It's in that precious name we pray, amen. So we recognize our sins, we've confessed that sin. Now we have this assurance of pardon and God's directive as to how we live. It's in the verses that follow the opening verses, the first three verses that I read. Paul continues, but, but because of his great love for us, God who is rich in mercy made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. So there's our assurance of pardon. God hears our prayers. God forgives our sins. And he gives us tasks to do. He's prepared them in advance for us to do. And so that's God's challenge to us. That's assurance, God's assurance to us in the coming week. Amen. Just want to mention for those of you who who may be visitors here, the collection plate will not be passed through the pews. There's a box in the back, a collection box. So on your way out or whatever you want, you can both go put the collection in that box. For those of you who worship here every week, don't forget there's a collection box back there <laughs> that you can put your tithes and all things in. And remember God's directive to us there to give as God has blessed us. Let's come down to God's presence in a time of congregational prayer. Gracious Lord and Heavenly Father, we come into your presence this morning. We come into your presence to praise you because we realize this morning that you are God, our creator, and Lord, we can see the majesty and your goodness all around us. Lord, on a morning like this morning, when we wake up and the sun is shining and the sky is brilliant blue and, and the leaves, the foliage has almost fully leafed and the temperature is warming, Lord, we realize your greatness and we see your beauty and we see your splendor and your majesty all around us. We thank you that we can realize, Lord, that that comes from you. It didn't just happen. It didn't happen through one cell dividing and then another cell. It happened, Lord, because you created it that way, and you created it for us to enjoy. And Lord, you've given us eyes to see. You've given us ears to hear the birds chirping and singing as they happily approach spring and summer. We, Lord, have seen your majesty in the rain that we received, the rain that has caused the crops in the field to spring forth, the corn to grow, the beans to grow, the gardens to grow, the flowers to bloom. Oh, Lord, how excellent is your name, how glorious is your majesty in all of the earth. We thank you for it. Lord, while we celebrate that, we also remember those around us who are struggling. Lord, there are those right now in this congregation, in this community, that struggle with physical and mental and even spiritual ailments. Pray, Lord, that you will be with them, that you will send your spirit to them in a very special way today, that they may feel your presence. Pray, Father, too, for those who are going through cancer treatments, as well as those who are waiting for surgery, those who are recovering from surgery, those who are waiting for the diagnosis to come back. Lord, these are troubling times for us and our loved ones. We know that you go with us. We ask that you will bless us. Pray, Father, too, for those who are who have chronic illnesses, who have aches and pains every day, whether it's caused by, by age or whether it's caused by a disability or whether it's caused by something that we've done. Lord, we ask that you'll give us the courage to face each and every day. We pray too that you will help us to, to trust you, that you know what is best for us, to know that you will carry us along. Father, we pray too for those who make their home in the care center. Lord, often they're forgotten, they're easily forgotten, especially in this glorious springtime of the year. Remember them, speak to them in a special way today to give them a wonderful blessing. But Lord, we pray too for those who work for the benefit of others. We're thinking now, Lord, of, of the doctors and the nurses and, the, and those who work in care centers, who care for those who are aging. We remember, Lord, the EMT people and, and the firemen and the police department and the sheriff's department, those, Lord, who watch out for our good, who watch out for our safety, 
often, Lord, putting their lives on the line. Remember them. We thank you for them. Thank you for, equip for equipping them to do those tasks, those tasks that we probably don't want to do. Lord, we ask, too, that they may see your glory and your goodness as they serve us. Pray, Father, too, that you'll give us sensitive souls to minister to those around us, those who are in need, those who are sick, those who are lonely. Lord, help us to remember that cup of cold water that you tell us to give to those who need encouragement. Help us to do that. We ask, Father, too, that you will be with those who have, whose lives have been changed in the, in the various storms that have happened so far this spring, fortunately not around here, but in many parts of our nation and around the world. We know, Lord, that some of those people who have been affected are your people. We ask that you will encourage them and walk with them and bless them. May, may the goodness of your people shine forth during these times of, of, of traversity in the lives of some people. And remember, too, those who live in war-torn countries. We ask that you will be with those who have to gather today in a hiding place so they can worship you, a place where the bullets whiz over their heads. Lord, we again thank you that we are not in that situation, but we remember those who are, and we ask that you will remember them too. Make them strong as they reach out to others with the message of the gospel of hope that you give to us. Bless the offerings we give today too, Lord. Be with us here in this church in Baldwin. Be with the elders and the deacons as they serve you through the work that you have ordained for them to do. Be to with Pastor Zach. We thank you for him. Thank you for bringing him to us, for his diligence in, in opening your word and, and sharing it with us, for teaching us, for teaching us how to worship you and for worshiping with us. Lord, we thank you for his presence here. We thank you for his family. Bless them as together we grow closer to you. Be again with the Church Universal, the other churches in our community, those who gather together this morning and call upon your holy name. Lord, may we unite as a community in praise to your name so that you may be glorified for you're worthy of all of our glory. Be true with those who are worshiping in countries where Christians are persecuted, persecuted for believing in you, persecuted for worshiping you. Lord, remember them. May they too See the strength and the grace and the love of the one true God that we've gathered to worship this morning here too. Look upon your church here, your churches in our world that struggle. Have mercy on us in our weakness. Give us courage and strength. Help us, Lord, so our faith may only be in you. Inspire us, Lord, to witness to all of the people we come in contact with right here in our community or wherever you send us so that your name may be glorified and that you may be praised. Send your Holy Spirit upon us this morning, we ask. Keep our hearts and thoughts in Jesus Christ, your Son, our Savior. In that precious name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. I'm going to ask the congregation now to rise, to stand together and sing the words of the doxology. We have a lot to praise God for. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Let's join our voices. <clears throat> Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Thank you. You may be seated. I invite you to turn with me in your Bibles this morning to the book of Malachi, the book of the prophet Malachi. Now, if you haven't looked in the Old Testament for a while, as human beings have a tendency not to do in our age, Malachi is the easiest book in the Old Testament to find outside of Genesis. Genesis starts it all. Malachi finishes it all. So in order to look up the book of Malachi, you go to the New Testament. We're more familiar with that. Page back about three pages. There you'll find it. The text this morning comes from Malachi chapter 3. And I'm going to read verses 16 through 18. Let me give you a, a little heads up on what was happening. So Malachi lived 
kind of at the time of Ezra and Nehemiah, maybe toward the later time of Ezra and Nehemiah, the people were, had come back from, from being in bondage in Babylon. The city was being, had been rebuilt. Ezra and Nehemiah had taken care of that. Malachi now is, is speaking, he's ministering to those people who are living in that city, those people, some of whom came back from the exile, but some have been born since, and this is probably two or maybe even three decades after most of them came back. Hear what the prophet said to the people. I begin reading at verse 16. I'm going to encourage you also to keep your Bibles open to that passage. Then those who feared the Lord talked with each other, and the Lord listened and heard. And a scroll of remembrance was written in his presence concerning those who feared the Lord and honored his name. They will be mine, says the Lord Almighty, in the day when I make up my treasured possessions. I will spare them just as in compassion a man spares his son who serves him. And you will see again the distinction between the righteous and the wicked, between those who serve God and those who do not. And then if you keep your finger in that, in that passage, I want to turn to the last book of the New Testament, to the book of Revelation. So we've got the last book of the Old Testament, the last book of the New Testament, not the last chapter, 22 chapters in Revelation. I want to dwell on, I want to focus your attention on chapter 20. I'm going to begin reading at 11 and read through verse 15. Then I saw a great white throne, and him who was seated on it. Earth and sky fled from his presence. There was no place for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. Another book was opened, which is the book of life. The dead were judged according to what they had done as recorded in the books. The sea gave up the dead that were in it. Death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them, and each person was judged according to what he had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is a second death. If anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. That's God's holy word. Let's ask for him to bless it to our hearts. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, we thank you for revealing yourself to us in such a convenient ways. We only have to page through the Bible and we see your greatness. We ask now that you'll speak to us this morning from the passages we've just read. May we feel your presence. May we learn. May we feel your directive for our lives so that we can serve you better. And so we ask that you open our ears and hearts and minds. In Jesus' name, amen. People of God, when I got married, I got more than I bargained for. Now, perhaps all of you husbands and a few of you wives can admit to that very same thing. You see, on our honeymoon night, the first night, Bonnie and I were together in the motel up in Turtle Lake. Before we shut out the lights, Bonnie pulled out her diary and logged the days, the activities of the day. Now, it was a Friday. It had been a very busy day for Bonnie. You know, back then for the groom, it wasn't so busy. I went to work at 5 o'clock. I came home a half hour early, washed the car, and I was ready for the wedding all day long. She had struggled and had done all of the things that, that what wives-to-be do in that day, and she logged all of those things down that night. And it was a long day. It was a hot day. It was an exciting day. I didn't expect that. I didn't expect that at all. The Benzomers, you see, aren't diary writers. My mother, I don't think, ever kept a diary. I, I'm sure if she did, we would have found it someplace. My sisters didn't either. We would have held that up against them a few times, I'm certain. And my brother and I, of course, didn't write anything down. Now, in the 50-plus years since then, her habit has not changed. Every night, before we shut the light off, she writes down what she or what we have done throughout the day. And she keeps track of everything. She is very, very thorough, very, very good. What we've done, where we've been, We've made a major purchase. She, she tells how much we paid. She writes that down. She writes down who she talked to. She writes down who we visited with. She writes down everything. Now, I'm not complaining about that, okay? This is not a complaint. I'm not complaining. It's not all bad. Because if I want to know, for instance, when the last time we painted the living room was, she can look it up. 
or when we put new covering on the floor in the kitchen, she can look it up, she can tell me. If I want to know the last time I preached here at First Reform, she can look it up and tell me. We have another place I keep track of that also, but she has that too. So rather than just being a diary, as some of us might think of a diary, this book is really a book of remembrance. A book of remembrance. Now there's a book of remembrance mentioned in our text for this morning too. And, and there's more of them, more books mentioned in the presence of God in heaven. We read of them no less than six times in the book of Revelation and other places too throughout the other books in the Bible. It's in this book, this book of remembrance, that the names of believers are all written down. Which means that you and I are inscribed in that heavenly book if we call upon the name of Jesus, if he is the Lord of our lives. It's written down so that you and I will never ever be forgotten and instead will ever be forever be upheld and cared for as one of God's children. It's a book of remembrance. This is what the church needed to hear in Malachi's day. He prophesied, he prophesied in the decades following the exile, like I mentioned earlier, but if you're expecting to read joy and optimism because of the recent freedom, you will not find it here. Not any place in his book. The people are instead discouraged. They're down and out. Life was very, very difficult, very, very hard, and the disappointments were many. So where is God, they asked. Does he still love us? If, if we're going to struggle like this, what's the point of serving him? Those were the kinds of questions they asked. In fact, their questions weren't a whole lot different than the questions that a believer might ask today. Does God see my pain? Does God care? Or is all of this just random and pointless? In these evil times, when the church seems to be shrinking away into the world, does our service and our sacrifice really matter? Does it make a difference? We find our answers to these questions and others in God's word through the voice of Malachi. Here God promises to preserve all who fear him. And we see this in a holy desire in an unholy time. Now, if we were make, to make a list of often used words of the Old Testament, of the Old Testament prophets especially, we would come up with words like sin and judgment and exile and repentance and restoration. But another word needs to be added to that list. That other word is remnant. Remnant. What is a remnant, you might ask? A remnant is a scrap. It's a piece that's too big to throw away and too pretty to throw away, but it's not big enough for a whole lot. It's just a remnant. And when I think of the word remnant, I think of people who quilt, people who make quilts. And I know we have some quilters in the congregation this morning. You know what I'm talking about. You have this piece of material left. It's too big to throw away, too pretty to burn, and so you fold it up and put it on the shelf with all of your other things. It's a remnant. That's what God's people were like in the days following the exile. They were small. They were much smaller than they had been before. But God wasn't about to throw them out. He wasn't about to abandon them. They were, after all, his chosen people. He had a purpose for them. He still wanted to make something of them. And it was from these leftover people, this remnant, this scrap of people, that God would bring the Savior of the world. And even though being faithful wasn't easy in those days, we read in verse 16, those who feared the Lord talked to each other. Notice, notice how the prophet draws a line, draws, draws a circle around this group of people, how he sets them apart. They're a remnant. The population of Judah was growing in those days. The church had more people in the pews than it had had in them for a long time. And among them were those who feared the Lord. Among them were those who took worship very seriously. We could say, we could say then that this remnant was stuck between the past and the future. The past for God's people had been glorious. As a nation, they had done marvelous things. And the future, in the future, by Malachi's time, there were many prophecies that were made, visions of the Messiah, of his saving grace, and of a new kingdom 
a new heavens and a new earth. But where is Judah now? They were between the splendid past and the hope of the future. They were stuck. They were stuck in this present time that seemed to be empty of blessing. Oh, yes, the temple had been rebuilt. It wasn't nearly as grandiose as Solomon's temple had been. It was there, though, and the people were, were busy again with, with their farms and, and busy again with their businesses, and the church had settled into a routine. It was kind of the same week after week after week, but now, now it was decades later. And there had been lots of people in Judah who hadn't been part of the deliverance from the exile. So that didn't even mean much to them. They're sort of like maybe an 8 or a 10-year-old boy today when we celebrate 9 and the tragedy of that day. They don't know anything about it. It doesn't make any difference to them. That happened before them. That was the scenario in Malachi's day too. And that's why when God said in Malachi 1 verse 1, I have loved you, the people's answer was so very, very hurtful. They asked, how have you loved us? You see, they had forgotten the promise of God's love. They had come to, to doubt his faithfulness. What do you think? Do you think that could ever happen to us? Do you think that could ever happen to us? I mean, we stop appreciating the mercies of God. Could that happen? I'm afraid the answer is yes. It can definitely happen. If we're not seeing how his gifts fill each and every one of our days, or if salvation feels irrelevant or important, unimportant to us, then we start sliding. We start sliding into that dangerous place of being discontent and dissatisfied. And we ask, what has God done for me lately? He's promised me great things. But all we have are empty pockets and unanswered prayers. How has he loved me? Why, why should we give anything to God if he doesn't give anything to us, if he doesn't give me what I want? It was an unholy time in Judah. In verse 5, we find a whole shopping list of their wrongdoings. God speaks there. God says, so I will come near to you for judgment. I will be quick to testify against sorcerers and adulterers and perjurers against those who defraud laborers of their wages, who oppress the widows and the fatherless, and who deprive aliens of justice, but do not fear me. That was the state of the church in Malachi's day. And of course, its reason for the, for the reason for its position is that they did not fear God. The reason for that position was sin. But, but there was still that faithful remnant. Verse 16, those who feared the Lord talked with each other. Finally, finally we find here the right response to God. It wasn't just believing in God. It wasn't just loving God. They feared him. They bowed down before the Lord's holiness. They revered his glory. They were in awe of his majesty. They submitted to his power. They depended on his grace. They were grateful for his favor. When one fears God in their prayers and worship and daily life, then they will recognize that God is greater and wiser and stronger than they are in every way. That's what God wants. That's how he wants us to be. And later, later we see that not only did the faithful fear God, they also honored his name. So instead of thinking of all of the ways that God wasn't blessing them at the moment, they gave thought to what never changes. They meditated on God's glory. Now sometimes when we hear the word meditation, we kind of get uneasy. We think it has something to do with mysterious actions. We think that it's overly intellectual or that, that it has something to do with yoga. But we meditate all the time, we just don't realize it. Like when you have some project at home, guys, when you have to put the door in the garage and you think about it from every angle so that you know what you're going to do the next morning. Wives, when you, when you make that special meal for, for friends or loved ones to come home, you think about that from every angle. That's meditating. I want to challenge you this morning to meditate about something better than garage doors and dinners there's better things to meditate on. Take an attribute of God, perhaps a Bible passage about his faithfulness or an example of his almighty power, and turn that over and over and over in your mind. Dwell on it. Meditate on it. Meditate 
on the Lord while you drive to work. Meditate while you mow the lawn. Meditate while you fold the clothes. Take one of God's attributes if you want, his love, his truth, his eternity, and consider what that means for his glory and for your comfort as his child. Such meditation will give you strength, will give you joy. Try it. It works. Malachi says, those who fear God talked with one another. He doesn't tell us what they said, but I think it's meant to contrast with the conversation that we find in verse 14. You have said, it is futile to serve God. What did we gain by carrying out his requirements? See, the righteous have a whole different conversation than that. They say, oh Lord, you are my God. I will exalt you and praise your name for in perfect faithfulness you have done marvelous things. Those words of the prophet Isaiah. The righteous can still talk like that today about how the God who made us and the Savior who saved us. Still, still it's easier for us to talk about the weather. It's easier for us to talk about other people. It's easier for us to share our views on the economy, to relive a, a sports highlight, to talk about politics. But let those who fear the Lord speak to one another about him. I want to challenge you again. For a second time, I want to challenge you to try having a conversation about holy things sometime this week. Perhaps you have to start it like this when you're speaking with a friend. Let me tell you what God has done for me. Such talk builds us up. Such talk brings glory to God. Jesus says in Matthew 12 that it's from the overflow of the heart that the mouth speaks. In other words, from the heart comes everything in our lives, both the good and the evil. Now, the bitter people in Judah weren't producing anything good. But you can be sure that those who feared God meditated. They meditated on his name, and they were obeying his word. And so they married in the Lord, and they, they gladly gave their full tithe, and they worshiped sincerely, because if you stand in awe of God, you'll also acknowledge that his path is always the best path to take. He always knows better than what you do. And you'll be glad that you found your your direction from him. But in this text, we also see God's determination to remember his own. Because God looks on his people, he doesn't just hear the complainers, he remembers the righteous too. Verse 16, the Lord listened and heard, and a scroll of remembrance was written in his presence. God listens. He hears all of those who fear him. Keep in mind that this remnant of believers was struggling. Their life wasn't easy. And even as they gathered to meditate on God's name, they probably felt that sometimes they were only talking into the wind, knocking on heaven's door, but no one was answering. That seems to be the normal reaction, especially, especially during times of trouble and evil. Perhaps you and I have wondered too if our concerns are too small for God or maybe too big for God. Or whether God sees our tears, the truth is, God notices, he hears, he answers. He hears when you, what you struggle with, he knows your troubles, he gives ear to your prayers, not one message sent through Christ goes undelivered and unanswered, not one. And to drive that truth home, God says that the names of the righteous will never be erased. And their, and their faithfulness will not go unblessed because we're inscribed in his book. We're engraved in that heavenly volume. Well, what exactly is that book? In the ancient world, cities and kingdoms would keep a list of names of all of their citizens. And, and to be on that list meant everything. It meant that you could receive all of the benefits of their support and their protection. Now think how valuable that would be during a time of war to be allowed behind the city walls, inside the city walls, inside the city gates where you'd be protected, where you'd be safe. The soldiers were guarding all around you on the top of the city wall. You were safe on the inside. But if your name was missing from that book, or if you had forfeited your citizenship somehow, 
Then your place is outside the gate. Alone, defenseless out there. Malachi was allowed to see such a book. And he told, he told the righteous remnant about it. He said, God has this book, and your name is written in it. That was good news. That was the good news that the people needed to hear. Look back at chapter 3, verse 2, if you have your Bible open, where God talks about his messenger and the judgment he's bringing. He asks, who can endure the day of his coming? Who can stand when he appears? For he will be like a refiner's fire or a launderer's hope. A fearsome cleansing was in store for the world and for the church. Now that kind of talk can bring fear into our hearts. I mean, who can endure the judgment day? Will we too be, be swept away? Will we too be burned up? Fear not, fear not. Malachi reminds us that God knows those who are his own. He knows them by name. He knows whether, whether we live or whether we die. We are not forgotten because we are written down. We're remembered. We're preserved forever. And that's what John tells us in Revelation 20, verse 11. There we find mention of God's book again. Then I saw a great white throne and him who was seated on it. So first of all, Paul draws a picture for us of what's going on in the scenario there's this throne room, which is the judgment room, and there's a great white throne there, and the judge sits on that throne. So the scene then is the final judgment, when Christ will judge all people. Oh yes, when he'll even judge the church, when he will judge this church in Baldwin too. Verse 12, And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and the books were open. And another book was opened, which is a book of life. The dead are judged according to what they have done as recorded in these books. So there are two books mentioned here in this verse. One contained a record of the deeds of every living person, everyone who had ever lived or died, good or bad, they're all contained in that book. Another contained a list, a list of names. Names of those who are citizens of the eternal city. It's known as the book of life in front of the great white throne. We see these books are open, and we see how they're connected. And we see how what a person did in his life is a basis for the final judgment. Did you believe? Did you fear God? Did, did your life show that it was claimed by God? The books don't lie. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm not talking here about works righteousness, not at all. But I want you to notice that the Bible tells us that books, that works are noticed. The good deeds we do do not go unnoticed. Now, in a way, in a way, it's terrifying to think about that, what I've just talked about. Each of our actions, think of this, each of your actions from the time you were a child, each of your actions being brought out into the open, all of the sins that we are so good at hiding in our lives will be exposed. The unholy things that we've camouflaged and masked throughout all of our lives are now read aloud in front of the congregation. Oh, how we dread those books being open and the ugly story of our lives being read. However, however, if we fear the Lord, if we walk in his ways, if we believe in Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, we have great confidence because because by faith in him, his work cancels out our every failure. His blood covers every one of our transgressions. So when, when a believer stands before God's judgment throne, and the book is opened, and there his or her name is, the page below it will be vacant, it will be empty. All of those things we've talked about, the nasty things we've done, the things we've said, the people we've offended, Nothing is on that page but one word. And I envision it starting at the, up at the left and proceeding down to the corner on the right. One word, redeemed. Redeemed. The price has been paid. Nothing else. Do you realize what this means? Earlier, rather, in Revelation 3, verse 5, Jesus says, he who overcomes will be dressed in white and I will never blot out his name 
from the book of life. You realize what this means? It means that when we persevere in faith, we will never, ever be forgotten because they're written down. Written down in the book of remembrance. Page after page, column after column, God sees the full number of his elect in Christ. He sees them all, and by his grace, we will be among them. He knows our name, and he won't forget. That means nothing but nothing can separate us from the love of Christ in Jesus our Lord. If that doesn't convince you, notice, notice how God speaks of his, of his remnant in verse 17. They will be mine, says the Lord Almighty, in the day when I make up my treasured possessions. That's how highly God esteems us through Christ his Son. We are preserved by him. We are precious to him. That's how highly God esteems us. We're precious. What that means is, in the judgment to come, God will show compassion. Verse 17, I will spare them, just as in compassion a man spares his son who serves him. In these words, we get a taste of New Testament reality where God becomes our Father in Christ. There's a bond here, a bond of love and affection. Seek the Father in your prayers. Seek the Father in your worship because he will always have mercy on his children. When we look at all of these images together, we see that Malachi couldn't be more emphatic about God's promise. We're inscribed in God's book of remembrance. We're considered his precious jewels. We're his own beloved children adopted into his family through Jesus. Let this give you confidence let this give you confidence. Let, let it move you to be holy. Then finally, finally, there's a clear distinction between the righteous and the wicked. In a godless environment where we're surrounded by people who don't serve God, there are many pressures. But perhaps one of the greatest pressures is a temptation to think that it's not worth it to believe in God. And I think, I think that's a temptation more when we're younger than when we're older, but it's still there when we get old. Now, maybe, maybe you think that when you witness what's happening in the world around you, where people sleep around, where they party all weekend, where they never go to church, where their language is coarse, where they pay no attention whatsoever to God's law, yet they seem not to suffer for it. To us, it looks like they're having a lot of fun living for themselves. And we think it must be nice to be so carefree. What do we do with that? Where's our reward for being holy? Is it worth it? The people in Judah's day were thinking that way too. Marry an unbeliever? Doesn't seem to matter. Give God the rubbish of your sacrifice if you give anything to it all. Nothing seemed to happen to them. Evil people seemed to be doing just fine while, while the faithful were no farther ahead. This is what some were saying. They were saying, it's futile to serve God. What do we gain by carrying out his requirements? Words of verse 14, which leads them to the terrible conclusion that we find in verse 15. But now we call the arrogant blessed. Certainly evildoers prosper. Even those who challenge God escape. This isn't a new struggle. We find it in the Psalms. We find it in the other prophets. It's always a struggle. The wicked prosper. The righteous suffer. We see it today, too. We see it in the world around us. So we may have to wait a while for his blessings on our labor. We might have to pray hard for his, his vindication and reward, but as surely as God is God, his answer will come. He will not fail us. He will not forget us. Malachi urges the people to hang on. If you're doing good, keep doing what you're doing, he says. Verse 18, and you will again see the distinction between the righteous and the wicked, between those who serve God and those who do not. Because there is a distinction between the godly and the ungodly. A distinction that cannot be erased. Now we know that God's vision goes beyond this life. God sees and God judges. If we were to read on ahead into chapter 4, we would find a reminder of exactly that. Very quickly, too, in verse 1, we read this. Surely the day is coming, it will burn like a furnace, 
All the arrogant and every evildoer will be, will be, stro- will be stubble. And that day is coming, will set them on fire, says the Lord Almighty. Not a root or a branch will be left of them. God's point is, everyone will again see the difference between the righteous and between the wicked. We'll see all the holiness. We'll see that holiness does matter. God doesn't forget. He doesn't overlook our prayers from each day, our sacrifices, the sacrifices we make for the church. He sees our struggle with sin. He hears our confessions of faith, our songs of worship. He knows if we're striving to live a God-pleasing life or not. And he promises. He promises that he will bless our faithfulness. Keep doing what you're doing. Keep on going. Keep pressing forward in God's strength. But to those who don't serve him in this life, Christ will say, I never knew you. Your name is not written in my book. So you'll have to leave the city. Your place is outside of the wall. Remember what else is outside of the wall? The book of Revelation tells us what it is, the lake of fire, which John calls the second death. Serious stuff we're talking about. And so with this message from Malachi, the last of the Old Testament prophets has spoken. God sent many messengers to his people, but Malachi is the last. In about 100 years, we'll hear from another prophet. Another prophet will speak in Israel. His name is John. We know him as John the Baptist. That's a striking thing because the very next prophet, after Malachi, 400 years later, announces the day of the Messiah, the long-promised Messiah. Now the Savior has arrived. And like it says in Hebrews chapter 1, in the past God spoke to our forefathers through the prophets at many times and in various ways, but in these last days he has spoken to us by his Son. That makes ours an urgent time. We've, We've heard the last prophet and we've seen the great Savior And we've met and we know the one who will judge. And so so pray. Pray for faith in the Son of God. Don't give up in an unholy time. Long for the time. Long for the day when Christ our Savior will come again to take us home. That's where we belong. Our name. Our name is written in the book. Amen. Amen. Pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you for your holy word, for the message it gives us this morning. Lord, sometimes it seems like the wicked do prosper in our day too. Sometimes it seems we would be happier if we were to chase after the things of the world. Sometimes, Lord, we must admit that we do. May the words of the text this morning that we read remind us. Remind us that our name is written in the book if we believe in you and that we have to believe in you, there is no other way. Remind us that even our deeds are kept track of. The Bible talks about a reward, perhaps it's for some of those deeds. But a book is written, a book is kept of things we did. Yet our salvation comes as a gift from you. Lord, may we be mindful of these things. May we meditate on on your truths. May we share them with others so they too may know the joy of serving you, and the promise of being included in that book. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. A hymn of response, he knows my name. When the music begins, let's stand and sing its verses together. And then please remain standing. I have a maker 
How wonderful it has been to be together in God's house this morning to worship and praise his holy name to hear him speak to us through his word. We hope that that word has been a blessing to you, that it will something, be something you carry with you and accept the challenges of it too in the coming weeks. Please plan to spend some time with coffee fellowship with us in the basement, coffee and donuts, uh, as we continue to praise our God in the, by speaking together as our text talks about this morning. And now to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. Amen. Our closing song in Christ alone. alone my hope is found he is my light my strength my song this cornerstone this solid ground firm through the fiercest drought and storm what heights of love what depths of peace when a fears are still when striving cease, my comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand. In Christ alone, who took on flesh, fullness of God in hell, this babe, this gift of love, and righteousness scorned by the ones he came to save till on that cross as jesus died the wrath of god was satisfied for every sin on him was laid here in the death of christ i live There in the ground his body lay, light of the world by darkness slain, then bursting forth in glorious day, a 
from the grave he rose again and as he stands in victory since curse has lost its grip on me for i am his and he is mine bought with the precious blood of christ no guilt in life no fear in death this is the power of christ in me from life's first cry to final breath jesus commenced my destiny no power of Power of- 